What do you love about being outside and active? I'm, I'm sure I've spent more time outdoors than in. That just feels like home. Enjoy what you can do because you never know what is around the corner. Just being outdoors in the fresh air, it just clears my mind. Fully immersed in nature is what brings me the most joy. Hello and welcome back to the Outside and Active podcast, where this week my special guest is Diane Westway. Di is the founder of Wild Women on Top. She is a global leader and award-winning woman of influence who has inspired her team to create life-changing adventures that get women walking in nature for good. 20 years ago, Di was fatigued, fed up, and seriously unfit. Then, out of the blue, a colleague invited her on a hiking expedition to remote South America. The experience transformed her life, and she realized there was more to fitness than sweaty, soul-destroying gyms or pounding the pavement. This episode of the Outside and Active podcast is perfect for anyone planning their next adventure or maybe interested in taking on their first ever adventure. Before we jump into the conversation, I want to ask each of you just for a small favor. If you forward this podcast on to someone who you think that would enjoy it just as much as you, then we'll be able to grow this outside and active community massively, which means we can continue bringing on some amazing, amazing guests to help educate, inspire and entertain. If you're listening on any podcasting platform, then make sure to follow. And if you're watching on YouTube, then please do drop a like and also a subscribe. Let's get straight into this conversation with Diane Westway. Di, I'm going to kick off this episode by offering you a piece of advice. And it's a piece of advice that has been left by a previous guest on the podcast. And that piece of advice comes from a lovely man called Jack Cornish, who is the head of paths at a organisation over in the UK called The Ramblers. And he was talking about a brand new piece of research, talking about the importance of paths and getting outdoors and going walking in the UK. And his piece of advice that comes to you is if there is a path or walk near where you live that you maybe haven't visited or tried out, then make a pledge to go and explore it, which is something that I've done. So I'm passing that advice along to you from Jack. And is there somewhere near you that maybe has just been something like, oh, one one day or I've, I've never been down there and I'd like to go and try yeah. that out? Yeah. Cool. What a great idea. Yes. That's Thank you. Advice. <laughs> well, and the other thing that I ask to everyone is purposefully vague because I like to see where guests take it. But what do you love about being outside and active? I love being outside and active because it brings me great joy. Uh, when I first sort of got outdoors and active, I think I've been active probably all my life, but most of my activity was focused around what I thought was good for my body. Um, but it's something I've learned later in life is that it's the mind stuff. It's the mental health stuff. It's the taking your mind into other places. It's the head clearing. It's the therapy. All that good stuff um, is the is the thing that I love. I also see the outdoors as an opportunity not just to connect with nature but also develop new skills and to be able to use nature as your gym um, so that, you know, rather than have to go and sweat it out in a, you know, in a, in a little room on, you know, man-made machines. Yeah. You know, if you start looking around you and open your mind to possibilities, nature provides so much wonderful gym equipment. Um, and, um, yeah, so I think that's been exploring that. Um, I'm a bit older now. I'm 63 and I've got bad knees. So um, that's forced me to take up mountain biking. Um, and then it's like exploring a whole nother part of, of, of nature. So, yeah, being active in nature is uh, is something that I, I think everyone needs to do every day. We did nothing else. So we, we'd all be in a happier, healthier, fitter place. And as people would have seen from the title, this will be talking about adventures and how to prepare for your next adventure or your first adventure. Um, but in this first half, I want to give people an idea about you and what you do and uh, the, the moment in your life that kind of transformed you to lead you along the path to where you are now and the amazing work that you do and so we'll come on to talk about that but your initial relationship with like you said the outdoors and physical activity through through gymnastics and other things like that was there anything else yeah, look, I started as a gymnast. I got lucky enough to have an opportunity to um, join a, gym, a local gymnastics club and spent many years uh, until I was 16 or 17. I was a gymnast, so I just 
spent pretty much every waking hour. If I wasn't at school, I was in the backyard um, doing cartwheels or climbing trees. So um, to me, that was an idyllic childhood. I then went on to become a physical education teacher. Um, but I was a very bad physical education teacher because I never learned to throw and catch balls. So <laughs> I was great when it was a gymnastics class or dance class, but not so good with the other. But it was actually later in life that I discovered uh, really the power of adventure um, to bring great joy and to lift, you know, to lift mood and to Im improve your mental health. That came about what, it, with what I now call my midwife crisis. I love that. I've had, um, I had that written down on your, because it was on your website and I was, I was in my next question. Midwife crisis is an amazing, amazing yeah, phrase. Yeah, that was a pretty bad time. Like, you know, you're, you look way too young to be thinking about a midlife <laughs> crisis. But, um, you know, for me it happened. I was I was about to turn 40 uh, and I was just like, I did not want to turn 40 to me. That was just like life was over if I got to 40. I had two young children. I was on that working mum treadmill. I was working as a radio journalist. Um, that was my second career after being a phys ed teacher. And um, I was just really miserable. And um, I saw this, you know, I got a friend invited me, or it was actually a colleague invited me to go and climb Mount Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain in the Southern Hemisphere in the Andes Mountains. And I just impulsively said, yes, like, I really want to do that. Like, that just sounds like a great, you know, like turning 40 is a great excuse. I didn't really want to have a big party. I'm like, nah, that's just too confronting. Or just go somewhere, just do something I never would have thought I would have done. So impossibly said yes. Took my best friend into joining me because I was quite terrified when I, you know, did a bit of reading about, oh, what, what is this thing? What yeah. is this mountain? Um, and we, you know, we got together. We trained at ridiculous hours. Sometimes we get up at 3 a.m. so we could fit training in before work. Um, and, you know, we trained our little socks off doing all the wrong things, you know, going into the gym and lifting weights and running along the beach. It's like, it wasn't ideal, but... We went off and had the most incredible uh, adventure in South America, three and a half weeks, I think it was. Um, we failed to get to the top of the mountain. Um, unfortunately, a bunch of things happened, but, you know, basically we didn't really have the skills. Um, our guide turned back to rescue somebody else, and it was kind of just one of those, as things happen in mount on mountains, um, and we didn't have the skills to kind of guide ourselves to the summit. So we came back feeling like we were, you know, complete failures. Uh, but... For both of us, um, it, it, it was that classic life-changing adventure. We'd we'd had our eyes open to this world where we met other people who were middle-aged people who left their families to go and do an extreme adventure, and you know heard their stories and went, oh, like we just couldn't wait to do it again. Um, and I just decided from that that I really needed to see if there was other women that wanted to join me because I knew I had this background in fitness mm. um, and my background in fitness had always led me into gyms or into schools um, and I just uh, sort of thought well we could do this out like let's do an outdoor fitness program and let's let's get fit for these big extreme adventures so that was really the beginning of Wild Women on Top. I put a note in the school newsletter. I think I've got two mums say, yeah, I'll, I'll come and go hiking at night time. <laughs> um, and then kind of friends of friends, we got a little group of eight together. Um, and eight women would, you know, on a Monday night, we'd, you know, put the kids to bed, we'd do the dinner in the bed and the story time and all that stuff. Um, and we'd load up our big 25 kilo backpacks and, you know, get our boots and our head torches and, We'd wander out into the spider-infested darkness of the nearest national park um, and we'd train for three hours with these heavy backpacks, you know, doing hills, stair repeats, hill repeats, exploring the bush, exploring the beautiful rock shelves uh, where we live. And it was just like the most, like as, a, as an escape, <laughs> it was like total escapism. Um, so that was kind of really the, the birth of this connection and then I started to realise the power of this thing that, it wasn't just me. Um, this little group of women um, were getting so much joy out of it and they were building their confidence and rebuilding their strength and, you know, things that you sometimes lose when you got, get lost in parenthood and, um, you know, you know, working, all that kind of stuff. You kind of don't make time um, to get into the bush. Like you said, go down that little trail that's near your house, yeah. you know. Like who's going to make time for that when you're, you know, when you're, you know, working and looking after kids and looking after whatever you do. 
so yeah, that was kind of um, what what got me into the whole adventure space. It seems like, and even just listening to the way that you speak about it there and the passion within it, it, like a whole new door opened in life and a new possibility that maybe think you didn't think was or there or, or possible for you. And it was helped very much by this friend or colleague reaching uh, out with an olive branch and, and extending yes. a, an invitation to you. And that's quite often actually how these journeys do start. How, we, how obviously pivotal was that? Oh, that was absolutely pivotal. Uh, it was interesting because the friend that invited me was um, was a personal trainer. He, he lived in the States. Like I said, it was a colleague. I didn't know him that well. I met him at a party. It's like one of those kind of things. Like, um, But we had a connection. We stayed in touch because we were both, you know, into fitness. Um, so it was a random thing for me to have said yes to. And interestingly, our friendship didn't re- really flourish because – he managed to get to the top of the mountain that we went on because he ah, came to and left us behind. So I was like, oh, thanks for the invitation, mate. <laughs> like, oh, Leaving like, us behind. <laughs> but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I go like, you know, it shit, shit happens on mountains, you know, when you're in, you know, in, in alt- high altitude yeah. and all those things. So, so, yes, it was an interesting one. And as you say, that invitation, someone just saying, hey, come and try this, uh, you know, is, is a very, it's a gift. So I know that I guess that kind of leads on to the question I was going to ask next about why you then went to set up Wild Women on Top, because as that person's invited you, you're then extending that invitation to, you know, an infinite amount of people to come and join you on your journey. What were the kind of micro steps in you actually physically and logistically setting up this new organisation and platform to support women on their adventures? Um, well, look, as I mentioned, I just, you know, put the ad in the school newsletter yeah. and I had this little group of eight. But how it came from just doing, because that was like a hobby, you know, I still did my full-time day job. Um, but but it sort of grew very, it didn't quickly grow in numbers, but it quickly grew in ambition. <laughs> um, because, you know, a glass of champagne, a little Christmas party, like let's go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro, let's go and do the Seven Summits, you know, like we just sort of suddenly went, oh, let's do that. And um, the group then did start to grow and I realised that there was something really special here to the point that I was like, I started charging then for the training and yep. we would, you know, we'd, we'd do it three times a week. We'd be training. Um, so, yeah, probably two years in, I was charging for the training because it was taking a huge amount of time. And then, as we know, with fitness, if people pay something, they're a bit more committed and locked into it. Um, so so it sort of grew into to the point that I couldn't do my day, day job anymore because it was so consuming. So um, I ended up resigning from my job as a radio producer to do this little thing full time, but I really couldn't work out how A, how to really pay myself enough that I could live off Mm. um, and B, how to reach more women. So it got to the point where I had eight other coaches. Um, I created this system of training for world-class treks. So it was called Trek Training. So it was a very specific outdoor training program that um, you would follow to train yourself up to do a challenging hike. So um, obviously challenging for one person is different to challenging for the next person, but it was a structured 12 week program. Um, and, and, you know, that grew, we had about 150 women around Sydney doing this training program coached by these coaches. Um, but I was quite frustrated because I could see the transformation that happened in these women and how much they loved it. And I was like, this is not enough women. <laughs> like. Um, and I did initially, just backtracking slightly, I did try and include men mm-hmm. um, because I thought, oh, it, if women like this, men will like it as well. But it turned out that the men that I spoke to were like, well, if I want to go and climb Kilimanjaro, I just go and climb Kilimanjaro. Like it's it's only walking, you know, I don't, <laughs> don't need a training program and a, I don't need someone to take me shopping to find out what kind of boots I need and what kind of backpack I need. And so I realised that what I was doing was a very female approach to mm-hmm. adventure um, and and then I sort of went, okay, let, let's just stick with, you know, where there's a, a need. Um, and from that, the next stepping stone to getting more women involved was I started a charity hike along the coast of Sydney uh, and I partnered with a, um, a global charity and the way it worked was we would have teams of teams of people, teams of four, and they would walk 100 kilometres all in one day or took a day and a night and a bit, some people, we would walk the coast of Sydney and they would raise money for the charity as well. 
And they would do that by asking their friends to sponsor them. So we found that the further you're going to walk, the easier it is to get your friends to sponsor you. And the money went to the charity. So it was this really unique kind of combination of having an adventure to train for that's with your friends, that's out in nature with a training program and this commitment, like I'm also going to do something for someone else. So I'm going to raise this money. And that, that became an event called Coast Trek, um, which is now around Australia in every state of Australia. We've raised nearly $50 million now for charities. Wow. Um, and we've had nearly, we've had nearly 80,000 people join those hikes around Australia. So it's not as, it's not as immersive as the early training I did where we trained together as a little community. You know, there was 10 or 15 of us in the dark and walking in the bush. Um, it's, it's not that, um, it's, it, but, but it's a lot more people. And, yeah. and of course my great hope is that I'm giving you a taste, you know, you're trying this little adventure or big adventure, hundred K's. Um, and then you're going to fall in love with it. <laughs> you're going to bring your friends and then you're going to keep doing it. What sort of time scale is this happening over from you putting the advert into the school to then raising lots of money for charity? That's a great question. It's actually been, um, it was 2001 when I put the ad in the school newsletter. And as I said, it was a couple of years. It was a hobby. Um, 2004 when I started the Wild Women Business where I started training and charging clients. And then it was 2009 when I started the Coastal Treks. Uh, Coast Trek is the name of the of the event. I started Coast Trek in 2009. So it's 15 years of the charity walks, um, but it's over 20 years of the, the little communities of women getting together and, and training. And as you said, as, as it starts to stretch out and grow, you might lose some of that intimate relationship with, you know, with what you're doing. But actually, there's still that mission statement. So in your words, what is the mission statement of Wild Women on Top? Oh, the mission statement of Wild Women on Top is to help women fall in love with health and fitness in the outdoors. I like that. I like that. And what sort of women are coming to you? Are they people that have been taking on adventures, have been involved in activity their entire life, or are they brand new and everything in between? It's the broad spectrum. Yeah. We have some complete beginners. Um, we tend to attract women, midlife women, uh, so women from 40 to 60. Uh, I think younger than that, they're just, they're just too, you know, <laughs> Just too much other stuff going on. Um, so, yeah, so midlife women and um, what was the question? I've forgotten. Uh, <laughs> well, what, 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 you know, what sort of women are coming to you and you must see the transition in their lives as you yeah. saw in your own life as well? Yes, they're, they're, look, they're mostly working mums. They're juggling families and work. Um, and But they all have they all have an element. Either they know someone, like there's that personal connection, they've met somebody who's already part of what we're doing, or they're looking for some sort of adventure. They're usually looking to add something. So with our Coast Trek events, 80% uh, of our participants say they signed up because they were looking for an adventure they could do with their friends. So I guess that's the majority. They're looking for something. They're not always looking for hiking, um, but I think that something that's social and physical and in nature. Yeah. And how many women have you had engaged with it over these years? Well, look, our Coast Trek number is 80,000 and 90% of our Coast Trekkers are female. Um, so we put no um, no requirement around whether you are male or female to do our Coast Trek events. Uh, but women love it so much when they do it that they tell their friends, and the next year we get more women, <laughs> the next year we get more women. Um, men usually only do it once. Um, and we think that's because women really like the walking and talking. Men like the men tend to have often a more competitive nature mm. and our events are not a race. So we just want you to complete the distance, you know, whether it's 60 Ks or 20 Ks, we want you to finish as a team, cross the finishing line. We give you a glass of champagne <laughs> and we, and we cheer you and we tell you you're amazing because you are. Um, and women seem to really love that. Um, so yeah, it, it does, it does seem to have an element of fi more female energy. Yeah. It's intriguing talking about listening to you talk about the difference between the so that the, the male and female approach towards hiking and adventure because that that certainly is the way i mean that it, there's a definitely a sense of women will be more open to trying new things and talking about their feelings i mean i was fortunate enough to on this podcast speak to a, a gentleman over in the uk called dan stanley who has set up a very similar thing for men to just say i'm going to go for a hike in wales or 
the Lake District or wherever in the country, mm-hmm. come and join me. Like, just come and join me. We'll have a chat. We'll talk about things. And yeah. that is starting to open up the conversation around men's mental health and getting people more engaged yes. in the outdoors. And it just kind of reminded me of that. But it's interesting that there still is that, like you said, men more competitive on the Coast Trek adventures, whereas yeah. women, you know, there to f- for groups they're in their groups want to have a good time and have the champagne at the end so interesting yeah. but but coast track is open to all and how does that kind of connect with wild women on top are they they it's together and raising money for charity is the core behind all of it yeah so so wild women on top is the master brand yeah. and um the staff my staff work for wild women on top and wild women on top produce the coast track event we also have um, micro communities where we kind of speak that language around training for world-class treks. And we partner with global travel companies to encourage women to kind of form their little groups, get training, get fit, and then go on these adventures. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, they're, they're kind of, yeah, that Wild Women on Top is the, really the master brand. Coast Trek is the event. Circling back to your own adventures and your um, own achievements, obviously, with Wild Women on Top and Coast Trek being two of the standouts but world's highest handstand 7,000 <laughs> meters Nepal I've just said a few words there but please elaborate on what I've just said I know it's a little random isn't it yeah, yeah so so um, as you know I was a, a gymnast as a child but I got you know you know life goes the way it goes and you know it is a young person's sport usually gymnastics so uh, you know I, I retired at 17 after I became the national champion because I thought I was all washed up <laughs> Um, but um, when I, after I started my women's hiking business, one of the in the early days, one of the climbs that we did, we went to Tasmania, which is a little island off the southeast coast of Australia, and we climbed the highest mountain in Tasmania, which would be a bit like your, not even probably as high as Ben Nevis. It wasn't very high, but it was quite rocky, and it was yeah. you know we, we were proud of ourselves when we got there. Um, and and someone just sort of said, well, can't we do something up here other than just stand here? You know, like we've just <laughs> climbed this mountain. And then someone kind of said, Di, you can do cartwheels and handstands. Why don't you see if you can do a handstand? So I had a little go. It wasn't a great handstand. I didn't fall on my head, but <laughs> didn't stay up for very long. But it sort of became this thing. And I was like, oh, like, you know, when I get to the top of a mountain, I should always do a handstand. So I started to rekindle that skill, um, you know, and sort of practice it a bit more in yoga. And it sort of became like my signature, my signature move. And then um, after I turned 50, I got this opportunity to um, go and climb a very beautiful mountain that had, that had been on my bucket list for quite a while. It's called Amadabalam. Uh, and it's in the Everest region. It's quite sacred to the locals, to the local Nepalese people. Um, and it's it's just one of those iconic high altitude peaks that you can climb if you don't want to queue up on Everest. Yeah. <laughs> you know, go the go the big guns. Uh, if you're looking to climb beautiful mountains, which to me became you know my kind of thing. Um, so I decided that it would be really good if I was lucky enough to get to the top. Um, and you know, it truly is, you, there's a lot of luck involved when you're doing those big mountains because anything can happen obviously with weather and, you know, the fixed ropes and all of that. So it was quite a technical mountain. Um, and I trained really hard and, you know, did a lot of handstands and decided that I should, if I got to the top, I'd, I, you know, I would have a go at doing the world's highest handstand. And, um, it, it was touch and go for a while. We were, we were camped at this quite, um, Quite dangerous place called um, Mushroom Rocks, which a lot of a lot of um, teams just bypass because there's a hanging serac, um, and we camped there just for like two hours, and the weather was perfect. And I was like, oh, I don't really think I need to do this. I feel <laughs> shit, you know. Like, are we really going up? But we did, um, and I got to the summit on a bluebird day, and I was like, I think I better do my handstand. So, Amazing. so yeah, I managed to climb the mountain, get down, which was the hardest part. It wasn't the handstand; it was getting back down safely. Um, and it, it became, it got recognised. Not by Guinness, unfortunately. They they wouldn't recognise a post attempt and they don't yeah. recognise anything that's the highest. But it was recognised by world record setters. And so far, no one's challenged me. I keep thinking I'm going to get an email one day. <laughs> it's been broken. Says. Yeah, but if it gets broken, that means you <laughs> have to I've go. I've done and... it on Everest or Choyoni or something. But <laughs> um, in the meantime, it's something that, you know, I continue. You know, I'm 63 now and I continue to now do handstands on cliff tops and just, you know, wherever I can. Yeah, the, <laughs> the photos on your social media are amazing of, of you know, the great landscapes <laughs> and then you 
doing doing a handstand in the for in the forefront. <laughs> that is definitely a good photo opportunity and a, and a and a great achievement as well as um, as another achievement that I wanted to come on to um, because in 2020 you were awarded an Order of Australian Medal for services to women's sport and recreation, uh, which is an amazing achievement. Where were you when you found out about this, and how did it come about? Mm. Oh, look, it was in the middle of COVID yeah. lockdowns, would you believe? And I got this email from, you know, government house, just sort of saying that you've, you know, you've been, you know, you've been awarded this Order of Australia medal, uh, but because of COVID, you know, we can't, <laughs> we can't do the ceremony. Um, but we ended up, um, they ended up delaying it for about, I think it was about a year later, mm. I ended up, you know, taking my mum and my daughter to government house and um, and getting the award. It, it was a it was a really great honour and, you know, came at a really great time in my life because, you know, we all we all had a shit time in COVID, obviously. Um, but I've had some business, um, just some big business challenges. I almost lost my business. Mm. Um, I got a business partner that just didn't just didn't get what we were all about. So it was great to get that to get that award and to sort of, you know, get that recognition. So, yeah, no, it's pretty special. Yeah, recognition's the, the right word because I, I, I kind of had written down an extra layer of validation for what you're doing, but I, the main validation is seeing all of the lives that you're transforming, but that word that you just use is, is exactly perfect, it's perfect for it because it just is another level of confidence in what you're doing and the recognition for what you're doing must have been an amazing thing to feel. Yeah, it totally was. And the fact that it was, you know, for women's, you know, women's sport, because people, most people don't think of hiking, mountain biking, rock climbing, being, well, rock climbing a little bit now, and maybe mountain biking a little bit, but people don't think of hiking as being a sport, but like, it's a very athletic, as you, as you probably know, yeah. you know, hiking can be in a very athletic um, endeavor. And I was just really, I was really chuffed that they were able to see it that way and say it was, you know, for women's sport and charitable causes, you know, that's really been 20 years of my life. And, you know, as you, as you know, that $50 million is an incredible achievement. And yeah. that's, you know, like I've been a facilitator, but that's been all of our coast trekkers that have all, everyone's done a little bit and, um, you know, it's added up to a huge amount. Well, this is the perfect opportunity for me to pick the brains of someone who is an expert in adventure and it, it's supported by the fact that you've written a book on it and how to prepare for world-class treks. So I'm going to ask you yeah. a few questions. We'll have a little bit of a chat around adventures and preparing uh, and maybe offering some bits of tips and tricks. Um, and, yeah. and the first thing I want to ask you about is people might be listening to this and think, oh, fantastic, I'm inspired. I want to go and do something. I don't know what I'm going to do something, but... I have these responsibilities, whether it be family, kid, uh, family, job, kids, something like that. How do you go about managing those other responsibilities in life? So I'm going to say, can I just say, repeat that question back? Is it so? So you're looking, how can you motivate yourself, or how can you actually make the time? Making time, <laughs> balancing time, I think yeah. is probably the key thing people will be wondering about. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me. And this is not a really good answer because it's been proven to be a bad idea. I slept less. <laughs> it's like, where are you going to find hours? You So I did hours into the night or I did hours, like I said, and getting up at 3 a.m. Um, you know, they do say eight hours is like the magic number and we've got to get that eight hours if we want to be healthy. But, you know, it, it is a difficult thing to squeeze it in. Um, the, the, I, I guess, um, the other thing that I did was I, I, it became my social life. So, yeah. you know, I didn't go out to the pub or I didn't go out to restaurants at night. Uh, you know, my entire social life became hiking adventures. Um, and I, and I loved it. So it was a way to squeeze in. Um, I included my kids, you know, the kids would come hiking if they were too little to do a hike, you know, they'd be jogging along somewhere and they'd be, you know, in the training. I included my kids in the training, um, all the along the way in fact my daughter learned her her times tables <laughs> <laughs> on the bike riding next to me while I was jogging so you know it, it was always that multitasking thing um you know I'd, I'd go for a hike and I'd be on the phone to my mum or you know yeah it, it's working out ways of integrating it in your life and not thinking it just has to be you know a hot you know a whole day on the weekend or whatever it's trying to do three times a week you know an hour or two Go hard, you know, so so don't just do long junk mile. Don't just walk for 10 kilometres on the flat concrete. Forget that. Like, 
do half an hour of hills and stairs with a heavy backpack on. So, yeah, if be, be efficient with your training um, and try and dovetail it so it fits in with something else, either family life or your social life. And we're talking about these these high level of adventures because well, I've spoken to guests in the past where we've spoken about the word adventure and gone, well, you can have micro adventures, you can walk to the end of your road, you know, every, at the end of every week and notice something different. But what we're talking about here is people that want to take on some some extraordinary adventures that maybe they wouldn't have thought that they would be able to do in the past. So if this next question is talking about how do I pick a location? How do I know where to go? What What is possible for me? What is going to be the best. So how do you go about picking a location or an ad- a place you want to adventure? Yeah, that's a great question. It usually revolves around finding someone else who's interested in the same adventure. <laughs> so for me, uh, it's not just the adventure, it's the adventure with somebody. Um, uh, you know, I do love the social aspect of it. So, uh, you know, I'm constantly on the lookout. I'm always talking to people and learning about their adventures. And then there'll be certain ones that will stick in my mind. I go, one day. So, like, last month I was in the Dolomites and I'd been wanting to go to the Dolomites for 10 years and finally one of my friends said, what about the Dolomites? I was like, yes, we're going to go to the Dolomites. So it really is that having a, having a buddy that wants to join you, it, you know, doesn't have to be many buddies, just one buddy is enough for me um, and that will give that location then it'll just bubble to the top and away you go. That kind of partially answers my next question because I was going to ask about going solo or going in a group. Obviously, for you, that social element is massive. But I have a lot of friends that actually have gone traveling or tried different things and they've like, no, I just want to go on my own, be in my own headspace. So what do you see both sides of that? Look, I totally get it. Uh, for me, when I do stuff on my own, I'll, I'll often do, like I have a, near my house, there's a little bit of bush and I'll do like a 90-minute loop around um, in the bush on my mountain bike. Now, that's really about fitness, getting out into nature, and it's head clearing. Um, so I call that, you know, that's like a micro-adventure, I guess. Um, it's it, it's amazing when you go solo how you can just get into your head and, it, you know, it, again, it's very therapeutic. I solve so many problems, you know, you know, when I'm out on my own um, in nature and it, 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 something changes in the brain. I know there's science behind it that you think differently, you connect the dots differently mm-hmm. in your mind. So I totally get that solo thing. Uh, but but for me, for, you know, in terms of a big adventure, it has it doesn't have a lot of appeal to me to go and plan a big adventure that I would want to do on my own. I'll be too scared. I'd be, like, oh, <laughs> I'd be the same. Happened? I'd be exactly the same. I'm on my own. <laughs> Um, so yeah and look I also think from my work I'm, I'm currently doing my master's in lifestyle medicine and wow. um, it, it, so it's all focus, there's a lot of focus on the things that we can do to keep ourselves healthy and well and prevent ourselves from getting chronic disease and I know through that that in terms of longevity um, connection to other humans is the, probably the most important thing that we can have for our health and well-being um, so you know so I guess that's a, another reason for me that I realise that that's has added benefits um, beyond my physical health, beyond my connection with nature. Uh, connecting with other people is is really what part of what key part of what makes us human. And if you're new to this adventure world, then if you start looking at equipment and clothing, it's a whole massive spectrum, and there's a whole there's so many brands and things. Obviously, depending on what you're looking to do, but so many brands and so many different things that you could buy or should buy or might buy. So what? Is your advice for people that are kind of new to this, but are thinking, what equipment do I need? Maybe health and safety stuff, maybe clothing, footwear. Well, apart from the obvious that sort of the Google search to kind of, you know, find out, you know, I don't know, I don't I don't relate to that as much, but it's it's great. Like mm. you get so much great information. It takes a while, obviously, to dig into it. I, I guess, as, as you know, I'm a connector, so I'd go into my local gear shop, you, you know, quickly learn which are the good ones, which are the ones that have got good staff. Um, and I would just basically say, like, when I did my very first mountain, Mount Aconcagua, I'd never... I had no idea, no clue where to start with the gear. And I became, you know, they became my buddies. Like I was in that shop all the time, talking to them about gear, trying on gear. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's a really good, really good place to go. And a lot of those, um, a lot of those shops also then obviously have the online content um, to sort of back up what you learn. But yeah, I think that's a really great way to learn. Just, just get Talk out there. And, we're not, yeah. Yeah. Talk to people. Okay. And you touched on it earlier, but motivation, finding motivation with other people from within motivating others. 
how can you do that? I mean, where does firstly, where does your motivation come from, and how can people that are listening to this find their own motivation? Because it's hard work. It can be hard work. It is. It can be hard work. I think the critical thing, and I think that's a great question because it's something that you know I, I strongly believe in and talk about, is once you sign up for the adventure, you, the motivation, like you, you it'll, it'll it'll be there, <laughs> unless it's a tiny adventure, like. You, you know, if, you, if you're taking on a challenge that frightens you a little bit and you're going to step outside your comfort zone, you'll be highly motiva- motivated to squeeze the training in the crack to do it all. And it does mean you'll get your life out of balance a little bit. And I'm not really, I, I, I don't, I'm not an advocate. You know, life is always out of balance, in the balance, out of balance, in balance, <laughs> out of balance. Like nature, you know, like this thing of like get in balance, like nah, forget it. Like, you know, if I've got a big goal coming up, a big adventure goal, my life's out of balance. I'm not going to vacuum the house. I might not even clean the toilet this week. Like, just forget it. I'm going to go out. <laughs> so, so yeah, it is just that. But then I know that, you know, once I've done the adventure, I'm, oh, you know, I kind of catch my breath. And I'm like, okay, I kind of deal with those things that have just been, you know, in a holding that just been sitting there. So then you kind of swing back. So, yeah, I think that's the power of the big goal. It does become an amazing motivator. And the other thing I think that's really great is the technology now. Like you can yeah. be measuring, you can measure how far you ride on your bike. You can measure your hills. You can measure your stairs. You can measure, you know, and I think that really for a lot of people, that's a great thing because they're going to look at their phone and go, oh, you know, I've done 10,000 steps a day this week and I've done, you know, 30 floors, 30 flights of stairs every day. Um, you know, that stuff can be also really useful. What's something that maybe we haven't spoken about that really sticks out for you that would really help someone prepare for their next adventure? Oh, what kind of adventure is it? Is it a hiking adventure or is it Hiking broader? adventure. Hiking adventure. Let's go with, let's go with that. Something that we haven't spoken about that would help them. Oh. Because we've covered, we've got motivation, health and safety, equipment, yeah. location. Um, but, but is there something around... Um, you know what 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 is actually being being smart about what's actually you're actually capable of maybe like physically cap- physical capabilities or are we encouraging people to break through boundaries um you look i think that uh, having little micro steps so um if you've got a big goal breaking it down into little steps because yeah. a big goal can be really daunting um and i remember talking to one of my clients a few years ago and we were going to climb mount elbrus which is the highest mountain in europe and um she was feeling a bit overwhelmed and i said oh how are you coping with it she had 12 children oh wow. By the way. So like, wow anyone with 12 children would be overwhelmed and i said how what how are you going about it because you know seem to be kind of getting you know to be on top of it and she said I just tell myself that I have to do something every day towards the adventure and not every day am I going to be able to fit training in but I've just got to do some little thing maybe it's just think about a gear a piece of gear or you know maybe it's just thinking about what I'm going to do you know how I'm going to cook a meal and put it in the freezer ready for the kids when I'm gone like something little towards that goal every single day so that the goal is constantly bubbling in your in your conscious and your subconscious, um, and then it's not so daunting because you're just doing a little bit every day, a little bit every day, a little bit every day. Um, so I think that's probably a really good tip. Just a final question before I, we come on to you know, ask asking you for your piece of advice. Um, interested to hear your thought and opinion on this because I'm a massive believer that there is no sort of age limit to being able to go on adventure and try new things because um, we've spoken to people that have, in a similar sort of way to you, maybe found, had a, had a transformation, like your mid midwife crisis and maybe thought yeah. previously that you wouldn't be able to, but actually uh, there's a whole new door that opens to this world. Um, and you will have seen a lot of people come to you, uh, to, to World Women on Top, later in life and trying to find something new is there an age limit to adventure oh totally not 100 percent not no no and look as much as i'm really sad that you know I, like i took up hiking as you know at 40 i took up rock climbing at 45 I took up mountain biking at 60 and my friends, even the adventurous ones are going like, what are you doing? What's like, next? Like, mountain 
fucking guy. That's ridiculous. Um, but it was because my knees were were so painful when I was hiking. I'm like, well, I've got to do something to get into nature. And I love mountain biking. It's so, like I'm not great at it, you know, like, but I don't go over the handlebars that often anymore so <laughs> that often um, yeah it's fantastic and look i've got a um you know i've got a i've got a new boyfriend and he's 61 and he's just taken up rock climbing so you know it's like the, it's the most fantastic thing i know there is no age limit when i was climbing in kalimnos um a couple of months ago i met this couple and they were actually an english couple and he was 80 and she was 75 and they were climbing up and i was just like in awe watching them climb these you know, quite difficult, yeah. difficult climbs. And I couldn't help but, you know, like have a chat with them. And I'm like, you're like, you guys are just awesome. Like, tell me your story. And he'd taken up climbing when he was 60 and she she was 55. And, you know, they just discovered this whole world. And they just said every year they go on a climbing holiday and they just think it's the best thing ever. So, yeah, like, no, no, no age limit. Just like, nah, just do it. But even that's <laughs> such a great message of you going, okay, my knees are hurting but I'm not going to let it stop me. I'm going to find a new way to engage with the outdoors. And that's how mountain biking has come about. Yeah. And I'm sure based off of your mentality and talking to you, there will be something else that will fit <laughs> in alongside all of the other things that you do at the moment. But thank you so much for coming on and talking to me and to the, to the listeners about your experiences and offering your pieces of advice. Where can people go to find out more about what you do? Oh, yeah, look, if you Google wild women on top, Dom, now you can't miss a word. It has to be the four words. It has to be wild women on top <laughs> together. If you miss the on top or if you miss the wild, <laughs> you're going to get something else. <laughs> so, Be careful with your uh, search you'll results. You'll find us. Wild Women on Top, all one word, you'll find us, and you'll find Coast Trek. Coast Trek is with Got One T. We are C-O-A-S-T-R-E-K. We are coming to the UK. Um, this is very secret now. I'm going to tell you a little secret. We're walking for mental health in the UK. We haven't launched our event yet, but um, we've partnered with the Mental Health Foundation, um, um, and we, uh, at this stage, it looks like we'll be we're hiking along the Jurassic Coast, um, and it'll be 30. You'll be able to choose 20, 30, 50 kilometres. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to be bringing our event series to the UK in 2025. Plenty of time to start training now and get ready for it. Um, but yeah, while we're on top, Coast Trek. Um, Google us, we do a little newsletter, and it, it is fairly female oriented our newsletter, but it's women and adventure because. Uh, Men don't need our help. They, they're all sorted. <laughs> We've got our own thing going on. <laughs> You've got your own thing going. You've got your own thing going. So, so yeah, that's that's the way. And you've offered so many pieces of advice and tips and tricks in this podcast, but one final one to ask from you is a piece of advice to pass on to a guest coming onto the podcast in the near future. So this is a really big one. So I've gone big, hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. Um, and what I've picked is, is to live every day like it's your last and what I mean by that is make sure every day is amazing and to make sure every day is amazing you have to do something physical because humans are born to be physical the reason we've got this body is to carry this brain around <laughs> and if we don't move our brain doesn't work as well as it should um, so live every day like it was your last get out into nature and get moving and no excuses. It just, you just have to do it and it's fun. I very much look forward to passing that along. Di, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dom. Lovely to meet you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Outside and Active podcast. You should now be ready to either take on your first adventure or upskill your current adventure routine. If you want more from the Outside and Active podcast, then please do check out the entire back catalogue. We have some incredible guests planned to come in on the future, but also that we've recorded episodes with over the past couple of years. If you want more from Outside and Active, then head to our website, outsideandactive.com, and you can subscribe to our newsletter where we send out news, advice, tips, tricks, competitions, and more every single week. We'll be back next week with an episode of the Outside and Active podcast. But until that time, I've been Dominic Brown. Enjoy the outdoors. <laughs>